for some of the images worldwide. Uh, and really, it doesn't matter whether you live in a tropical area or an extra tropical area. If it floods and if your sewers flood, uh, then the effects are very much the same. So these are the sorts of dramatic pictures uh, that encourage us to create better models um, and better warning systems. Um, Boram Lee will be speaking about the uh, WMO's Coastal Inundation and Forecasting Demonstration Project. That's one of the projects that sits within my expert team. Uh, and what we try and do is we try and help, um, we capacity build, and we help develop systems um, to provide suitable warnings for situations like this around the world uh, where the forecasting systems are perhaps not as advanced. Um, and this project, of course, is all about how we can use satellite observations try and improve or support the system um, the, through to the warnings and through to the stakeholders. And I suppose that a take-home message um, from this workshop and from this, this, uh, this project is for all of us that are involved in storm surge forecasting to think about how we can best use Earth observation data because this project is going to provide a fantastic portal, uh, a facility for getting it. And we, we won't yet to start doing all of the things with it that might be feasible. So I ask you to think as inventive people about how we might use the data uh, on top of the things that we're already doing. Contact sea level is rising. Um, sorry, this is a bit of an old slide, but the, uh, the fifth assessment report uh, provides very similar figures ranging, ranging between 30 and 90 centimetres, including the ice sheet melt. Sea level rise will ensure that any storm system and wave system will reach a higher level than it previously did. So all of our coastal engineering, which is geared to statistical return periods, will start to see an increased frequency of the current return period. And on top of that, populations are migrating to the coast. So risk, in some crude sense, is the multiplication of the hazard times the exposure or the vulnerability. So the risk is increasing for certain because of sea level rise. Whatever you think might be happening to changes to weather systems, and at the moment there is no evidence to suggest that they're changing, um, one of my final slides has got some, um, some fundamental truths in it, and the fundamental truth is that climate models don't have weather in. Um, so you can't really say very much about how the weather is changing until climate models do have weather in. Um, so we really don't know, um, but irrespective of that, the risk will change um, and the vulnerability is, is a large part of that as, as coastal megacities increase in number. So I just want to start the technical side of this by saying that you know, coastal flooding is caused by extremes. We're concerned about mean sea level. Um, we mustn't forget about the tides. And then we have storm surges on top of that. And then we have uh, wind waves, the short period waves, and, and the swell waves that have caused so much coastal damage around Europe this winter. All of those combine to create the coastal hazard. And it's the total, the total water level is what you want to deliver. It's the only thing that makes sense to a coastal engineer. So sea level, well we know that's rising, uh, where satellites are making a, a distinct contribution. And here's an obvious example where in the last 20 years, uh, 20, 24 years now, um, satellites allowed us a more global picture of the sea level record. So from satellite altimetry, sea level rising at 3 millimetres per year. Slightly higher figure than that that you get if you look at the long-term history of the high-quality tide gauges. But of course, within that record, there are shorter periods where the, the sea level rise was again 3 millimetres per year. So this is, this is an area where satellites have certainly helped us understand the sea level hazard. Tides are changing. And you can show that if you, if you take some sea level rise, some indisputable sea level rise, it changes the tidal systems. It changes the location of these tidal amphidromic points. Um, the scale here, in case you can't see, this is a, a 20 centimetre tidal range. Um, if it's blue, it's down. If it's red, it's up. Resulting from a two metre rise in sea level. So the Netherlands. If you get a two metre rise in sea level, on top of that, your tidal range is likely to change by 20 centimetres as well. And this picture is true globally, so you don't forget the tides. Uh, 20 centimetres doesn't sound like very much. It sounds like a, a small surge. But as our colleagues in Cork will tell you, there's no such thing as a small surge. If you went past the River Lee this morning, you saw the difference between the water and the top of the concrete was about that much. Now, there's no such thing as a small surge here on the, on the east coast of Ireland. Uh, so sea level is changing. The tides will change as a result of that. Um, and then, of course, we have storm surges 
It's the effect of the weather, it's the effect of the low atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, uh, whether that be a tropical cyclone or one of our mid-latitude depressions, an extra tropical cyclone, it doesn't matter, the physics are the same, and then the strong winds combined with Earth, Earth's rotation um, and then some sort of coastal barrier. This is a storm surge that um, was referred to previously. This was the storm surge of 1953 that caused tremendous damage in Europe, uh, in the UK and in the Netherlands. Um, this is Hurricane Katrina. Um, so the, the same results arise, although, of course, from tropical cyclones you can generate storm surges of up to 8 metres, um, whereas with extratropical cyclones we tend to get storm surges of, of usually 2 to 3 metres. Uh, and the global significance is enormous in terms of lives um, and in terms of value. And of course, what we're trying to do is save lives and protect um, property. This winter, we've had, a, we've had a particularly stormy winter in Europe because of the position of the jet stream and the, the baroclinic activity in the jet stream. Um, this is in the southwest of, of the UK, a place called Newlin, uh, where we have one of our British tide gauges, in fact. Um, massive plume of a wave there. Uh, and the conditions that we've had this winter actually prompted um, the British Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, to get involved in the climate debate. He's, he's right. Um, these are very severe weather conditions, and that is climate, in a way. Uh, and the answer is it rather depends what you mean by climate. Um, climate used to be defined as the sort of average of meteorological conditions. Only recently have we started to interpret climate as what man is doing to the atmosphere and whether or not we can model it with a great big global model of everything. There was a time in history when the word climate represented those conditions which were sort of geographically typical of a particular region. Um, and in that sense, David Cameron is absolutely right. Anything like this this is an aspect of climate. But it's worth looking back historically through some of our, uh, uh, with sort of telescoping timescales, um, to see whether this winter is particularly unusual. It's certainly unusual, but the answer is it's not particularly unusual. Um, so this is a, um, a light vessel which measures wave height off, off of um, the southwest tip of the UK, so in the Atlantic Ocean. And these significant wave heights of nine metres have been measured quite consistently for all of the storms that we've seen this winter because of the position of the jet stream um, and the nature of the Atlantic swell. If we go back further in time, this is a report I dug out of the library of the institute that I work for when it, it had a different name. It's, it's had many different names. And if we go back to the 1980s, these significant heights of around nine um, were certainly exceeded. This is the same, same, the same light vessel. Um, so we've been seeing 9 metre waves. Well, back in the 1980s, we saw 10 metre waves. Um, so we have seen this before. And it builds up this picture of, of windiness um, as part of our climate, uh, having this sort of 10 to 20 year decadal variability. And if you look at all of the studies in the literature on the last 100 years um, from reliable observations, this is one from, from some Met Office colleagues in the UK, you start to see this decadal picture of um, storminess. And we could have a whole discussion over lunch about how you define storminess. Is it the number of gusts over 60 miles an hour that you record at more than three weather stations? How do you define storminess? Um, but we know for sure that storminess reached a peak in the 1990s, whereas it had previously peaked in the 1920s. So that to me is climate, and I'm very pleased to say on record that David Cameron therefore is right. As a result of all of these uh, disastrous weather conditions that we see around the world, and I'll talk, I'll talk about um, tropical conditions as well, um, we've developed some fairly mature and robust operational systems uh, to make forecasts. And the one thing that is for sure is with, with sea level rise um, and with the increasing vulnerability due to population movement, these forecasting systems that we rely on are going to get used more often. We need them to be robust and reliable because they're going to get called into action on a much more frequent basis and I'm sure operational people in this room um, and certainly in the UK at the Met Office have been on duty every two or three days recently since the beginning of January uh, because of the extreme conditions. Uh, so typically speaking we have a suite of computer models, um, atmosphere models, driving storm surge models, preferably with good tides in, um, preferably coupled to wave models. We have real-time observations. I could put a satellite picture here as well because satellite altimetry is part of that. 
feeding into an operational centre where you have the expert forecasters who are providing a 24-7 view. I'm not going to put any equations up. You've seen a few. If you want to know how to build a storm surge model, one thing you could do would be to go to the WMO guide to storm surge forecasting. Um, it's got everything you need to know about the history of storm surge forecasting. You can find all the technicalities there. So I'm, I'm going to try and just talk about some aspects that previous speakers um, perhaps haven't covered. So we can start thinking about what could be improved. Well, the, the models that we tend to use, um, a lot of them for storm, storm surge forecasting, both um, here in Europe and in the tropics, are two-dimensional depth equations of motion. So for those of you who are physicists, the shallow water equations. Um, you can use 3D models, but then you've got all sorts of choices to make about how many levels. Um, there are certainly benefits to using a 3D model if you want to couple the wave field. And the red box, the red um, and orange sort of rings there, what can we do about this? Well, we can, we can try and improve the meteorology, that's critical. Um, we can take a look at spatial resolution. Um, we can perhaps think about how to use data assimilation. So these are all ways that you could make the models better. They're very good. I mean, these models do a good job. I think you've, you've seen that already. Uh, but we can still make them better. Uh, so what about resolution? Well, um, lots of people have done lots of experiments here. This is just one that we did in the UK where we compared a 3K model of the, of the European shelf with a 12K model. And then we did some comparisons at tide gauges. We calculated the root mean square error. And if you just quickly run your eyes down this column, you get a feeling of a, a root mean square error of about 10 centimetres. And it really doesn't make an awful lot of difference because of the resolution. And that's because it's using the same meteorological resolution. So one conclusion to come out of that is that there aren't that many benefits to using a highly resolved hydrodynamic model if your weather is, is not at the same resolution, because you're forcing multiple cells of your hydrodynamic model with pretty much the same wind vectors. So there has to be a, a, a kind of a proper tight coupling of the meteorological resolution with the hydrodynamic resolution. I'm not ruling resolution out, I'm just saying there has to be a tight coupling between meteorological and hydrodynamical resolution. Because there are some obvious advantages, um, you know, with a f an unstructured model you can get this beautiful complicated picture of currents um, coming into you know, these very unsophisticated British bays and harbours. <laughs> um, go to Scotland, it's even worse than that. And so there are some obvious benefits of these unstructured models. Um, but again, when you sort of take the acid test and measure it against the thing that you've got, which is a good tide gauge, um, again we compared... Uh, model uh, with our 12 kilometer operational model and on the basis of those data and I agree that you, you can only measure you can only measure where you've got a tide gauge altimeters might change the picture a bit um, quantification um, is is not convincing but there are some very good examples, and here's one here, of where high resolution in Hurricane Katrina, simulated by the ADCIRC model, actually allows you to sort of pinpoint places. And particularly if you're feeding into inundation models, then there's an argument then for, your, for the resolution of your surge model to match the inundation model. So really the driver, I would argue, is matching. You need to match the resolution of the, of the forcing meteorology and you need to match the resolution of any subsequent inundation. You don't, you don't want a 12 kilometre sea model flooding 300 cells of a list flood model. So it's all about uh, complementarity and matching within the model system. This is really important. Um, do not ever use the simple difference between the observed sea level and the predicted tide as a measure of anything. It's a very simple undergraduate exercise to take a, a sine wave, step change it, phase shift it just a little bit and subtract one thing from the other and you get a wonderful residual signal which is, which is absolutely meaningless. It's just the difference in timing. The only thing that really matters is the difference between the high water that you observe and the high water that was predicted. And it doesn't matter about the aspects of timing. Um, the Dutch, I think, first were the first to call that the skew surge. Um, and certainly within the community now, um, we are encouraging that as the, as the most appropriate metric of, of what the weather is really doing to the system. And of course, you just get one value per tidal cycle. So it's also a very good integrator of the weather system over 12 hours and over that particular basin.
One of the interesting things, this is a slight digression, but one of the interesting things you find about the skew surge is that if you try and correlate it uh, with the, the height of the tide that it falls on, it's almost completely decorrelated. There's no evidence of the tide having an effect on the storm surge generation from the data, but I'll show later that you can see it in numerical models. It, it is a factor, um, but it's actually very hard to see it in the data. This is just a, a complete decorrelated jumble. And the reason is that we have very few data. We've only seen, um, from a tide gauge record, at, at most we've seen you know, 100 years of weather. And as we saw from the previous bar chart, over that 100 years, only two decades were particularly stormy. So we've only got a few decades worth of good weather systems upon which to base our statistics. Um, it's advantageous if you, if you believe that the storm surge is completely decorrelated with the tide, then it makes producing these sort of joint probability curves very easy because you can just treat the two things as completely separate dice um, and then you can combine them uh, and that allows you to arrive at return periods um, in a much simpler fashion than, than was, was available before. So there is a first order effect of the tide on the skew surge, um, but roughly speaking, you can treat them as independent for statistical purposes, and, and that's quite useful when it comes to uh, calculating coastal returns. Uh, and this is also something you can demonstrate for, uh, for tropical cyclones, although, although this was based on um, North Sea data. Um, so we've talked about um, we've talked about. I just want to talk a little bit about uncertainty in the wind, and Ad, Ad talked about ensembles. It's very simple to show how a 10% wind shift can make a huge difference. So this this experiment here was for a surge event, I think, back in 2006. Um, we quite deliberately perturbed the wind fields by 10% arbitrarily, but you can get, and again, the, the focus of most of these large changes is along the Netherlands coast and in the, in the German bite here, um, almost three quarters of a metre's difference in the surge just by deliberately perturbing the wind. The biggest argument you need uh, for taking an ensemble approach to prediction. Um, another argument, though, is that coastal planners and engineers they, they've got some, some low threshold that means something important to them. It could be the, the height of a seawall. Uh, it could be the level at which you need to close a gate. There's always a level. And it's not sufficient for computer modelers to give a determined forecast with an implicit error. We all, we all know that there's some sort of error in it. The coastal engineer wants us to place an explicit risk curve around that median value, and ensembles do that. Um, so that's what we use, um, and that's why we use a probabilistic approach. So we, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't see the future. That, that's what we're trying to do when we forecast. Um, and satellites can't see the future either, unfortunately, so we need to bear that in mind. Um, but they can see the present, and sometimes a very accurate view of the present is what you need to better predict the future. Um, so we don't have any of those, but we, we, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have very powerful computers, uh, and we do have some equations that govern the flow of fluids on, on the Earth and in the ocean. Um, so we, you know, we chop the Earth up into chunks of varying sizes, um, and we try and solve on those computers as best we can. Um, and if we get it wrong, and there was a famous incident, I think three years ago, when the UK Met Office predicted a very hot summer, and in fact it was, uh, it was a very rainy summer, and they were, they were sort of criticised for that. You, know, you, run, you run the system ten times, if, it's, if it rains seven times, and, and you predict You've done a very good job, I and mean, that's, that's how probabilistic forecasting works. It's all in the interpretation. You've got to, you've got to train the forecasters, that, that bench of 24-7 people, to correctly understand how to use probabilistic forecasts. Um, and a very simple way of expressing that is to say that if the, if the spread of the ensemble is narrow, then that gives much more confidence in any forecast that you're going to put out. Uh, if the spread is wider, then you, you need to perhaps, as a forecaster, um, be more cautious in, in terms of what... Um, and there are some very nice graphical products, and you can, you can have sort of probabilities of exceeding certain levels for certain coastlines. So uh, ensembles allow you to deliver some very nice graphical products, but then they need to be very carefully interpreted. And it's exactly the same 
in tropical cyclone models. This is a slide from um, an Indian colleague, Shashir Dubé. Um, all of the same applies apart from the fact that the atmospheric forcing for tropical cyclone models tends not to come from numerical weather prediction because numerical weather prediction at the moment does not resolve hurricanes sufficiently well. It's, it's getting there. It's, it's probably within the next 10 years. Uh, but at the moment, all of the operational storm surge modelling uh, that is forced by tropical cyclones, hurricanes, uses some fairly simple uh, parametric models of the wind fields. Um, and, and those are based upon the drop in the pressure, there's the central pressure drop, um, the direction of the storm, where it's going to make landfall, and the, the radius of the maximum winds. And those parameters um, determine much of the tropical forecasting that we do. Um, but they're still amenable to an ensemble approach. So what I'm trying to argue really is that we can still take an ensemble approach for tropical cyclones, uh, even though we need to approach it from a slightly different direction where a successive forecasts of um, Cyclone Bidgley, this, this comes from the, uh, the IIT group, um, reveal very different forecasts, and then when the best track is finally available, um, you get a different forecast again. So we somehow or other need to take those uncertainties and convert them into something that is operationally useful. Um, so I'm just going to show you some results from a piece of my... PhD student, Matt Lewis, did. Um, we were looking at the, the total uncertainties when you try and forecast inundation. So you go from the surge model uh, through to the inundation model in an area of Bangladesh. Um, there are obviously many uncertainties. Perhaps the greatest of them is the, is the topography you try and for your inundation model. Um, and then really what Matt was trying to do um, was see whether the uncertainties in that inundation science uh, were bigger or, or less than the uncertainties in the, in the hurricane storm surge science uh, which forecasts it. So we, uh, we calibrated this against the uh, cyclone SIDA um, example to, to make sure that the, um, that the system behaved well when we used the best hindcast of that. I'm just going to cut to the results really, uh, which are these here. Um, when it comes to quantifying the uncertainty, so we took, we took an event that we thought was a 1 in 50 year cyclone, um, and what we were able to do by testing together all of the hurricane tracks in the Bay of Bengal, uh, testing for some independence to, um, to pull their parameters, and then we took plus or minus one standard deviation, just as Ad suggested. Um, you can take two or three standard deviations. Uh, but on the basis of plus or minus one standard deviation, then the central pressure that you put into these parametric cyclone models results in a different inundated area. The difference is 300 square kilometers approximately. The biggest um, factor that made a difference to the inundated area was the angle at which the cyclone approached the coast. So that tells you immediately that if you're trying to build some kind of probabilistic system where you perturb the central pressure, um, you perturb the time, um, you don't really want to be perturbing the DEM, you want to have the best digital elevation. Um, but the direction of the cyclone approaching the coast is critical by the time you feed it through in, into inundation. Um, and these things are very important, and it's, just, it's only just been published, but we think it's a, it's a beginning, at least, for helping to develop um, an approach for creating an ensemble of, um, of tropical cyclones. So the track uncertainty is key. You've got to have the right DEM. Um, and it's, it's the starting point, that's all, um, for operational people to then have a think about how they might use these findings uh, to build um, ensembles of cyclone models. Which sort of just tells us that surges depend on aspects of the weather system. Uh, this is just a very simple example. We were deliberately speed of a, of a, of a depression, and you just, you can just changing the speed, but without changing the pressures or the actual wind strengths themselves, it changes the length of time that the storm spends over a particular uh, basin. So if these were wind waves, you would refer to that as the duration. Uh, and it's just as important in the case of storm surges um, that you get these parameters absolutely right in your weather model. So it's, you know, the critical thing here is getting these details in the weather model. So I'll just quickly show you that um, the state of the tide does make a difference. Um, you can't see it in the observations, as I showed you previously, 
But with a model, um, you can take some, some storm systems and then you can deliberately put them on a spring tide and a neap tide without changing any other any other factors. And when you do that, you start to see, in fact, that the smaller tides, so the smaller tidal range, uh, neap, neap tidal ranges, uh, generate larger storm surges. So there is a correlation. It's true for the extra tropics. Um, we're going on now to show that it's true for the tropics as well. Um, but interestingly, you cannot see it in the tide gauge data um, because the tide gauge data have so much variability due to weather. And all of this only works if you've got a way of getting that science down through intelligent interpretation into an effective response. And if any of this chain is broken, um, then there's no benefit. There's no benefit to science if you haven't actually got a way of delivering it stakeholders who care and in a, lang in a language that they understand. And I think this is something that the, that the oceanographic science community has learnt from the, from the hazards and from the coastal impacts community, and it's a lesson very well received. Um, here's an example. The Isle of Man is a little island in the Irish Sea. It's about half between, between here and England. Um, and during 2002, um, the British operational storm surge forecast system was forecasting a giant storm surge. Uh, I dare say the Irish operational storm surge forecast system was forecasting the same surge. And the Isle of Man didn't have access to any of those data. And so they simply didn't know it was coming. So this is the major, the major port harbour on this small island. simply because people were unaware that it was going to happen, yet every, every European operational system was forecasting it. So there was, um, and I think another thing is recently we've, we've had examples um, in the Philippines where the, the nature of the advisory uh, that goes out through what are called the, re, uh, the Regional Specialist Meteorological Centers, which is part of the WMO, I got, got that right, Boram, did I? Um, they are word limited because these things are sort of pinged around the world. System. There are only so many words that you can put in these messages. So these, these very general, broad messages that come out of these sensors don't give you the local detail that, again, requires much more local interpretation. The sort of thing, again, Ad, you were saying, where you, you divide the coastline, or was it, was it um, Christine, where you divide the coastline up into 100 segments and you then colour code them. Those sorts of natural hazards, impacts, presentations are really important because if, if that's all you know, you don't know if that's your village or the other side of the island. So it's absolutely this sort of graphical approach. Um, so there we go. It was a bit quicker than I intended originally, but uh, you know, it's absolutely important that we get all of the physics into the, into the driving. Um, sea level rise cannot be ignored. It's going to make any coastal hazard more frequent. Um, we already are seeing... And just to stress this project, We've got a database now for improving our analysis and our now casting, and we can start to think imaginatively about the ways of improving our forecasting. And, and really, this data is going to become a, just a, a springboard, we hope, um, for future research in this area. So I'm just going to leave you with um, just a couple of home truths, because I want to be absolutely clear. Uh, there are no hurricanes in numerical weather prediction models at the moment. Um, there is no weather in climate model at the moment. Um, so these, you know, these are just truths. Um, and um, certainly where we live, where we've got quite significant tides, you can never ever unravel the tide from the storm surge. Um, because the weather affects the tides, it usually just changes the timing of high water. And the state of the tidal cycle, which we can see through models, although it's, it's not easy to see it in the data, does affect the amount of surge generated. And this like to be even more important in the uh, in the tropics where the the surge signal is that much bigger uh, so really we have to have models that are as coupled as possible rather than adding things together because the addition of those errors is unacceptable when you're seeking a, a 15 centimeter accuracy uh, so i'll leave it there thank you very much